What I'm going to talk to you about today is something which I've not talked to audiences about before. So this will be a bit of an adventure. It's kind of, I'm going to actually talk about some specific research which I've been carrying out very, very recently. I will have to explain a few technicalities, but I will try and do that in a way which is not at all, hopefully, intimidating. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is, I'm not just going to talk about paranoia, I'm going to talk about extreme belief, because we live in a world in which extreme belief is increasingly perceived as a problem. I certainly think it's a problem. And uh, therefore, we need to kind of understand extreme belief. I've spent 30 years of my career studying paranoia in particular, but I've been studying it in psychiatric patients. Uh, and I'll explain a bit about that in a second. And it seems to me that an interesting question is whether any of that has any implications for understanding non-psychiatric extreme beliefs, or to put it another way, whether people like myself who are interested in, or well, he started out being interested in the extreme beliefs of psychiatric patients, can learn anything from looking at other types of belief systems, such as political belief systems or religious belief systems. So let's start by thinking about pathological and non-pathological beliefs. So I, as I say, I've meant, spent my life talking to a lot of people who apparently have very strange beliefs, bizarre beliefs, in the context of a psychiatric clinic. And in psychiatry and clinical psychology, we call these beliefs delusions. And we tend to assume that delusions is sort of just qualitatively different than other types of beliefs. Um, so, and they tend to have certain types of themes. So, for example, the most common theme is the paranoid belief, where the person believes that they're being persecuted in some way. So I once had a patient who said to me very quietly, Richard, it's okay for you to admit this. I won't let on to anybody else that you have admitted this, but you know as well as I do that the South African service is out to get me, don't you? And he, this person thought the South African Secret Service had arranged his compulsory admission to a psychiatric hospital. Next to persecutory beliefs, we have grandiose beliefs. So uh, I once had a patient who, I should say just by the way, as a kind of uh, caveat, I'm no longer in clinical practice, this is going back a few years, but I did have a patient who once told me that he was the inventor of the helicopter and the pop-up toaster. And he was outraged. Yeah, it was sort of quite comical in a way. But he was outraged by the fact that his millions, which he believed he was owed due to these inventions, were being stolen from. Ideas of reference or delusions of reference. This is also quite common. It tends to go with the paranoid belief. First. So this is the patient who tells you that... Um, this radio announcer or the TV presenter, that message is really specially meant for me. Okay? I know it's been broadcast to the nation, but there's a secret message embedded, and it's for me. Erotomania, much less common, but quite well recognized. So typically the person, it could be male or female, thinks that somebody who is you know, usually a movie star or somebody like that is secretly in love with them. And the last one on my list, it's a bit of a peculiar one, delusional jealousy, because you might think the belief that my wife is about to run off with somebody is not necessarily a delusion, and it seems to me it's a bit dodgy to think of it in that way, but it's certainly there in the psychiatric literature. Uh, sometimes people say, there are some people who say, this is the only delusion which is true in reality, because what tends to happen is the person with delusional jealousy pisses off the spouse so much <laughs> that they do, in fact, run off. And I actually had a, and actually, although we're sort of laughing about it, it's a serious issue, because I actually had a patient who exactly that happened to, and he committed suicide afterwards. So it is, it's, it's, you know. Uh, but we can, if you've not got to look far to find tricky cases, my favorite example of a tricky case is describing this fantastic book by John Cracker called Under the Banner of Heaven. And it concerns two Mormon fundamentalists, uh, Ron Dan Lafferty, uh, uh, who visited their sister-in-law in, um, in Utah in 1983 while their brother was away. And they murdered her. And they murdered his infant daughter. And after they were captured by police, they'd made a very half-hearted attempt to get away. They told the authorities that um, they were doing this at the order of Jesus Christ. And in fact, one of them, Dan, later said, and still maintains to this day, he's in a supermax jail now, that he is the prophet Elijah. And he thinks the walls of the jail will collapse and he will walk forward into the, wor into the world. 
Uh, Ron is on death row, and there's a big debate going on at the moment. Well, actually, there's a debate of a trial between mental health professionals. Six mental health professionals testified at his trial. Three thought he was psychotic. Three thought he was just in the grips of an extreme religious belief. And they couldn't decide. Uh, and that's still going on now, because in America, you can only be put to death if you're not mentally ill. So there's a big argument going on now about whether Ron is mentally ill. But we all, perhaps most people are more familiar with the case of Anders Breivik, who similarly, you know, he carried out mass murder in Norway. And similarly, there was a huge dispute at the time of his trial about whether he was mentally ill or not. He said he was acting on behalf of the Knights Templar, which was a secret organization, and he was defending Europe against feminism and Islamification. And uh, initially, he was diagnosed as psychotic, and then uh, in his trial, actually, he protested that. He thought it was very insulting to be called psychotic, <laughs> and he was found not to be mentally ill and was found guilty of murder. So these are tricky cases, and it raises the question, how do we know the difference between a psychiatric belief and an extreme belief which isn't a psychiatric belief? And the closer you look at it, the more difficult this comes. So there's a, we call it the Bible of psychiatry. It's the, it's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders. It's the American manual which lists definitions of everything, basically. And they tell us that delusions are fixed beliefs and are not amenable to change in the light of conflicting evidence. Okay, when was the last time you had a political argument with somebody and ended with that person thumping themselves on the forehead and saying, how could I have been so stupid? <laughs> you know? He says, uh, the belief is held despite what is clear or reasonable contradictory evidence. An earlier version of the manual actually also added that the belief is not ordinarily accepted by other members of the person's cultural or subculture, but that seems to raise the possibility that you could cease to be deluded by the simple expedient of hitching a, tr a plane ride somewhere to somewhere where you could find people who would, believe, would agree with you. So this is, you know, it's very hard to draw that distinction. And it gets more hard when we think about the kind of odd beliefs which we all encounter in our everyday daily lives. So paranoia, remember, that's the most common type of delusional system. And psychologists have recognized now for quite a while that paranoia exists at a low level, just in the healthy population, the normal population. My friend Dan Freeman, who's at Oxford University, has this, he illustrates it with this paranoid triangle, he calls it. So the idea is that at the tip, you have the extreme beliefs of psychiatric patients, but down at the bottom, you've got these, what he calls social evaluative concerns. You know, the sort of thing where you go into it, oh, a room like this, and you're looking at people and you're wondering, what are they thinking about you? Right, so that sort of thing. Now, actually, I'm not going to go into, I am going to explain some statistical stuff, but I'm just going to go flash up something very quickly, but don't read it because it's a bit complicated. But, um, but basically, we can test for that difference if we've got a large enough sample. And whether we've got a continuum or two groups. And uh, I managed to get data on about uh, over 2,000 healthy people who'd filled in a paranoia measure uh, and about 600 patients. Uh, it happened by, almost by accident. We'd done lots of studies and we suddenly realized we got all this data. And we used three different statistical methods to do this. And each method clearly showed that we had a continuum, not two categories of people. So paranoia is more or less. You know, at one end, you've got people who say things which seem like really crazy, like the South African secret police want to do me in. At the bottom end, you've got people who are kind of boring. And somewhere in the middle, you've got people who, <laughs> who sort of feel paranoid under some circumstances or to some degree. And when it gets a bit high there, it gets a bit troubling to other people. Most of us can think of people maybe we've encountered in the workplace who seem to make a par paranoid interpretation of everyone, of everything. Uh, I was once asked by a journalist, by the way, if I'd ever hear, experienced hallucinations. My response was no, but I work in a, high, in a British higher education system, so I counter paranoia all the time. It was a kind of quit, but it's sort of true. So, um, and that raises the interesting question is, is, you know, how would we recognize it if we were deluded, everybody was deluded about something? Maybe there are delusions which we all have. For more debates, talks, and interviews, Subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.